to have sex with just one person forever and ever and ever, or should we just accept it's unrealistic and stop pressurising ourselves? Journalist and author Helen says we should give in to our sexual urges, but relationship expert Sarah thinks we were created for just one relationship and commitment for life. Helen, when you say give in to our urges, what do you mean exactly? Well, I think it's in our nature to seek sexual variety, and I think if we do stay with one person and we repress all these urges, then we are denying ourselves something and I think it ultimately will only lead to resentment. I suppose the marriage vows are all about denying yourself something but in order that you can achieve something else. So you deny yourself variety as you say, you deny yourself the pleasure of having sex well, with I someone don't. you don't know that well but instead you get love and commitment and you hope a firm basis for having children and for living happily ever after. I'm an old romantic as you can tell. Well but I d it's interesting you say you know love but I'm I don't think that um, <clears throat> a promise is any basis for love. I mean, love should exist on its own. And I'm not saying that love can't last forever. I very much hope that it can. Mm. But I don't think that we should tie ourselves to a vow. I don't think that should underpin our relationship. And, and, and I think what is quite sad, in a way, in, in a relationship, or any sexual relationship, is that as soon as you have a sexual relationship with someone, then, then that person has a claim over you all of a sudden. This is the problem with the way that we view relationships. Suddenly, just because you're sleeping together, that person then expects you to go to weddings with them, you know, go to the supermarket with you on a Saturday. And I don't think that is natural. We should be able to separate our sexual connections and our sexual attraction to our emotional bonds and our intellectual attraction and our romantic Yeah, but attraction. you try telling that to almost anyone you know. If you say to any girl you know, any bloke you know, or you see your boyfriend, you see your girlfriend, you see your husband, you see your wife, you know you love him and he or she loves you. Well, hey, but they've also slept with that one and that one and this morning they're going to sleep with that one and tomorrow with that one. They will be, they will be hurt somewhere deep, deep in their heart and in their psyche, won't they? I think there's a lot of social conditioning that goes on that makes makes us think that a, a, you know, sexual attraction is linked to an emotional bond. And in actual fact, you know, I th it doesn't necessarily follow that you know, love can deepen um, whereas the passion can fade. And I think that is evidence in itself that the two aren't necessarily linked. And I don't think sexual attraction to someone else necessarily threatens a bond you know with your partner i think if you're if you're in that initial stage of real you know romantic attraction you know the heart flutters initial stages of a relationship then i don't think you you're attracted to other people you know i'm certainly not mm. if I, I just because i don't believe monogamy doesn't mean i'm promiscuous i have to have an emotional attraction to someone absolutely mm. but I, I think that stage you know will that stage of real romantic love that lovely part of the relationship will fade. It doesn't mean that your bond won't fade. You can still have a very strong relationship, but the sexual part of it um, will fade. Let's and bring Sarah into this. I mean, you know, you're married, you've got a child. Uh, I don't know what the state is of your sexual relationship, but I mean, would you be happy for your husband to go and find a little variety with a few other women? Would you like to do the same thing? Absolutely not. And I, I believe that actually... Um, opposite to what you're saying, that actually a sexual relationship can grow and it can deepen and it can get better over a lifetime. It doesn't have to be this expectation that I s somehow we've got this sort of myth going that it has to be on the wane um, for years. I interviewed Habit, Having said that, though, I mean, that's a lovely thing to say, that a sexual relationship can grow and deepen, and I'm sure in certain ways it can. But if you ask people, what was it like when you first met your partner? And they'll be like, oh, my God, it was fantastic. We were going at it, hammer and tongs, you know, on the stairs, on the kitchen table, in the back of the car, it was fantastic. And when you say, well, do you still do that, the answer is usually, well, not really. It's kind of like twice a week if we're really lucky. So it, it, it isn't increasing in frequency and passion, although the love may be growing. Yeah, and I think, you know, it will it take on a different um, a form, that sexual relationship. And I, I interviewed a fantastic couple the other day who were in their late 70s, and they said, uh, oh, yes, we still do it, don't we, dear? And it was, yes, well, it's the quality, not the quantity, isn't it? And, but it was just that lovely, <laughs> <laughs> lovely Are sense. Are you not that attracted these... to other people? Or, you know... Or... I mean, I'd love to eat, you know, 10 cream cakes all at once, but that's not to necessarily say that I should, um, or that it's helpful for me. Sex doesn't make fat. <laughs> Sex doesn't make me fat. You know? But I think, I think both for um, us as individuals, us as a couple and us as a society, I think there's very good and solid reasons why we have monogamy and absolute faithful monogamy. Um, I think as couples, I think, you know, if we saw the royal wedding, if we think about, you know, our own relationships, our own wedding, we don't go down the aisle thinking, in two years' time, I'm going to go and, you know, 
find someone else. We go down the aisle thinking, this is it, this is for life. This is someone I want to be my companion. If, if you're not so sure about so something, so, sorry, Helen, enough. if you're not sure about something, it's always a good idea to call in an evolutionary biologist, and that's exactly what we've done. Dr Robin Baker's on the line. Hello, Doctor. Hello. Uh, it's, a, it's a big leap, isn't it, from the comments I've just heard to evolutionary biology. But, well, I um, suppose we want to know, are we programmed to be monogamous or is it almost impossible for human beings to remain faithful to just one partner forever? I, I certainly wouldn't say we were programmed to be monogamous. Um, if, if, if by uh, is monogamy natural, you mean uh, is it the form of mating system that uh, the earliest humans used, then I would say definitely not because the, the most basic mating systems that anthropologists have discovered are in the tribes scattered around the Amazon basin and Indonesia. And uh, these were rainforest hunter-gatherers and uh, uh, smallish groups. And it's not quite true to say that everybody had sex with everybody else, but, you know, it's, it's, much, it's much nearer the truth than to say that they were, they were monogamous. And um, they didn't even have a sense of paternity. The men didn't even really have a sense of paternity. Um, they hadn't connected sex with reproduction. And uh, their, their thought was that a baby was conceived by a spirit entering the woman, and it grew by collecting material around itself, some of it from, the, from inside the woman, and some of it uh, from the semen from the men that she has intercourse with while she's pregnant. And I say men because... Uh, she would probably have sex with half a dozen different men during the time that she is pregnant. And because they, feel, they felt that, uh, that the semen was being incorporated into the baby's body, then they had a sort of sense of paternity that any man who'd had sex with the woman had contributed something to this child. But because there were several of them, then these tribes had a sort of shared paternity where the baby was really being brought up by several men, in fact, virtually the whole, the whole group that they were living in. Okay, so well, it sounds, it as sounds, far from monogamy as you can get. Sounds delightfully communal. Just because that was the state of things then, can we conclude that that means that we're not really up to monogamy now? We haven't got what it takes to stay faithful? Uh, no, I don't think it says that at all, but I, I think it says uh, that we're, we're not programmed to be monogamous. I, I think the key to human... Uh, relationships is that it's very flexible. Uh, in, in Britain, uh, most of Europe, um, people sort of have this image of monogamy as the reproductive unit, but we mustn't forget that it equally, uh, equally, dare I use the word, civilized societies, um, industrial societies, polygamy is the rule. And so uh, I, I think humans have got a flexible system. They have an initial um, sort of promiscuous streak in them, so that even where you get monogamy, you get a lot of infidelity, which seems to be just as natural as the monogamy. All as right, I'm going to stop you there. Say. Thank you very much indeed. Let me go to Ben and the sofa surfers. Uh, I ben? Just for the record, I find monogamy sexy. Well, I, that's I, nice I really to do. Say. It, 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 it really yeah. turns me on to know that. You know, I, I, I'm with one partner and everything like that. Kate, what do you think? When you're younger, yeah. I think for any young person, you need to go and experience the world. You need to see what it's like. You need to, to sleep offer. with loads of people, is that what you're saying? Uh, not necessarily sleep with lots of people every single night or anything like yeah. that, but I think you need to explore the world safely. Yeah. Um, because people try to settle down too young. I'm moving with a boyfriend, I'm 18. You're too young. You need mm. to go and see what the world has to explore, has yeah. for you to explore. And... Obviously, I'm in a different situation now. I'm a bit more settled, and I think life does change for you. But when you are married, I do think you have to be faithful, and you have to, but you have to work at the passion to keep that going, and stay together. Mm. I always wonder about this working at the passion thing, mm. Sarah. People always assume. I mean, because the idea of passion and hard work never seemed to me to go that closely. Uh, hand in hand. I mean, do you feel that you have to work at the passion? Does that work, working at passion? I think there is an element of work in relationships, which, as you say, can sound a bit off-putting. But I think if you're going to have a lifelong relationship with someone, you can't just rely on the feelings. Um, it has to be a choice as well. And I think that's where we go back to the marriage vows. When you say those vows, you're making a choice to love someone. Um, and that might mean having to, you know, forgive or say sorry when you don't feel like it. It might mean... Um, 
choosing to put them first when you don't feel like it. Um, it might mean staying in the bed when the person's snoring. You know, it, there are different things, but it, it Helen doesn't, doesn't have to seem convinced yes, at all. See, I think the, the whole idea of yeah. a lifelong relationship to me is, well, for one, it's very scary, and I also think it's very unrealistic. And we're putting a huge demand on ourselves. Now, I don't think, uh, you see, I think humans, or um, possibly Robin, <laughs> would be able to, to um, enlighten on this, but humans are somewhere in the middle of swans and dogs. You know, we don't just go and want to get our legs over and, and just have sex and no. then never see that person again. There, should, there has to be a connection, you know, an emotional connection. But I don't think we've, we're, we've evolved like swans to mate for life. I think we are programmed to, for long-term relationships, but not necessarily lifelong. And there is a theory that I've heard of that um, humans will are, are programmed to have a bond with their partner for as long as it takes to raise a brood. So, and which could possibly explain why we have a, a seven-year itch. Well, Helen, thank you very much. No scratching of any itches while we're talking on the programme. Thanks to Helen, thanks to Sarah and to our caller too. Coming up, it's all about actress, producer and environmental campaigner Trudy Styler. We'll be back in a minute.